Okay, and welcome back. Uh, it's always a pleasure to spend time with uh, these two gentlemen, one of whom is with us tonight, Cliff High. This is uh, going to be a very interesting hour. The website is halfpasthuman.com, Adventures in Future Viewing. Let me read what they do in case you're not online right now. Here at Half Past Human, we forecast the future. We are not alone in forecasting the future. All humans do it to some degree. Just a quick search of the Internet, of course, will provide dozens of forms of future forecasting. Some use astrology, some use other methods. We employ a technique based on radical linguistics to reduce extracts from readings of dynamic postings on the Internet into an archetypical database. With this database of archetypical language, we calculate the rate of change of the language the rate of change in the language being used on the Internet. The forecasts of the future are derived from these calculations. Our calculations are based on a system of associations between words and numeric values for emotional responses from these words. These emotional impact indicators are also our own devising, of our own devising. They are attached to a database of over 300,000 words. This data base of linked words and phrases and emotions is our lexicon from which the future forecasting is derived. We call our future viewing the ALTA, A-L-T-A, reports for asymmetric language trend analysis. The ALTA reports are available by subscription. I've been reading them for several months now, and they are truly fascinating. Welcome back. Cliff. Thank you very much. Is it a cliffhanger? <laughs> In a sense, yeah. From what I've been reading, it, it certainly is. Um, but reality is that way, isn't it? it uh, yes. These are not boring times we live in. Uh, part four is just up, and I've been reading. Uh, I'm almost finished with part four now. Uh, how long have you been doing this for our listeners who are new to uh, to you and, and George Ewer? your partner's work? Um, well, I've actually been thinking around with the concept since 1994, got active with uh, SQL Server and most of the code base that allows me to do some of the linguistic joins in 1997. Uh -huh. And um, I've been pretty much uh, fortunate enough to be able to do it full-time since about 2004, I believe. But we've had reports out um, essentially... Our first one was 2001 when I happened to come across George Ure's site and uh, saw a mind there that was uh, not an idiot, to put it bluntly, mm -hmm. and uh, so shared my thinking with him, and he and I crafted a little thing that basically predicted the release of energy. That later became the attack, uh, uh, manifested as the attack on 9-11. Now, when you say a release of energy, now, that that is a... a uh a good way to sum up what they do, they, they, they look for changes, George and Cliff, in the general terrain of language used. And there are, there are several modes that come into this, this uh, entire forecasting. There is, I, I'm going to use my own word, there is, I guess, anticipatory language, uh, and then there is another, and then there is release language. Release language usually begins immediately after the event that is being forecast by the anticipatory language. That's and very it's, concise. That's a very good way to put that, yes. Yeah. Thank you. If you ever need any help, <laughs> let me know. Uh, no, I'm just a, a enjoying this and trying to wrap my mind around it because it, it does reflect uh, basically a new way to read the universal mind, the collective unconscious, if you will, which is uh, quite able to uh, exercise precognition and does. And, All uh, the time. And it's around yeah. us at, at thousands of levels, as I discovered in the 90s when I was just uh, playing around with large masses of data. I came up from the uh, in the software business out of the phone company, out of what are called OSPs or other service providers. Mm -hmm. And these are the little companies that sit all around the country and they eat up all the phone records and do the processing for the big boys and basically spit out the phone bills every month. So you get used to dealing with hundreds of millions of records. And it's a fascinating uh, way to look at data. 
in huge, large masses. And I discovered things about language just in the process of living, I guess, that led me to think that there was more to it than we perhaps gave credence to. And that, for instance, uh, let's be you were your previous guest. I was tuning in and listening on your uh, the free stream there, mm-hmm. and you were discussing the UFOs and so forth, and you made a very uh, prescient, it turns out, and very precise statement about how interesting it was that the UFOs that were sighted in the 50s looked older, that is to say, in our context, more antique than the mm-hmm. current ones, less mm-hmm. weak, etc. Now, let's cast our mind back because you're, you're honing in on an archetype. And we find out, for instance, that if we really look at UFO history, that's true across time, uh, some astounding number of hundreds of years. In the 1800s, for instance, the UFOs of the day were called airships. And they, they transited around on the uh, electrical lines that we were stringing all over the planet in the form of telegraph wires. And uh, that was the, the uh, nuclear plants of the day. And that's where they were centered mostly. Energy, was, right, yeah. Correct, and, and electrical at that. And, but the context of the, of the time was the UFOs presented themselves as airships, or we perceived them as airships, whichever way you want to look at that coin. There's two sides of it. Right. And if, and if we're looking at it in the 50s, we see the the ships at the time that, uh, appeared mechanistic and, and something that if you and I were to think of it, more uh, big, thin car look. Right. right. Okay. 50, 57 Cadillac. There you go, exactly. And these days, we've got a different archetype going that seems to be morphing. What with the drones that are now appearing? Mm-hmm. What if it's uh, a situation of a pattern emerging, mm-hmm. uh, either that we are able to perceive the phenomena in a greater degree of technological re- um, recognition, and thus they appear to evolve over time, but the underlying phenomena is the same, or corollary is that they're presenting themselves in a form that they think we can understand. Hmm. But in, in any event, neither none of that is material, but basically you've honed in on an archetype that we see all the time. And getting back to that in language, uh, if we look at uh, cultural groups like the British, uh, the British have a good archetype, and we look at slang a lot. Slang is really good because it's the bleeding edge, the very uh, far edge of change in language, and so the appearance of new slang terms that take off and, and uh, go ladder, which is a term that we use to refer to ladder diagram uh, growth patterns, which are the same kind of patterns you might see in a uh, virus in an orchard, for instance, or mm-hmm. in any kind of a population. Right. But it, so if it goes viral, more or less, uh, then we know that there's change coming. And, uh, now, give me, if, Cliff, right. can you give me an example of a, of a slang term that sure, has... Sure, sure. Let me give you a couple uh, of them and how they vary across the... Because uh, slang comes and goes. It, it erupts Correct. quickly and it spreads like a virus throughout the uh, spoken consciousness of people who use slang terms, and then often it can fade away. Or sometimes it can become more formalized. Yes, and, indeed. Uh, that like, itself is a, is, yeah. a, is a unique sort of a thing. Like, look at the British with their term of brilliant. Anytime anything is really um, exceptional... They say brilliant. Mm-hmm. They've been doing so since 1920s uh, with a consistency <laughs> that is just truly amazing. Because right. slang usually doesn't persist that long. Right. Now, is it because that indeed they're talking about, or, or their, their language emerges from a society that's rather uh, dark, uh, that there's, you know, it's expressing in a, an emotional archetype that, for instance, they label things as brilliant because the rest of their lives are not. We find this kind of a pattern emerging all over. If we look at the word cool in the United States, we talk about temperature a lot. Brilliant, for instance, refers to the underlying archetype of light. So you can take from that the light-dark duality, and here we have the temperature of the hot-cool duality within our culture. Right. And if we go and we look at the Soviets in the, in the 50s, their slang at the time was uh, translated into our language would be sharp or to the point. Mm-hmm. And is that because they were living in a dull society? Mm-hmm. So these archetypes are around us at all these different levels, and all we do is really compile our typical relationships between words and then go see how they pop up. That's sort of our serendipitous approach. We right. can we can go hunting for, for things, but we just don't do that so much anymore because it's so much more fascinating to see what is delivered if we just turn on the taps and uh, let the data flow. Right. Now, you have uh, written the software for this, and you use what they call spiders, and you send them out to do their little crawling and surveilling uh how many do you send out uh it, it it doesn't really work that way it used to uh, a number of years ago you used to be able to actually run 
uh, your software on other people's servers. Uh -huh. but of course, the Internet is a lot more hostile these days. So instead, really what our spiders do is sit on a server that's multitasking, 64-bit operating system, uh -huh. and each one of them gets a certain amount of program space, and then they just start eating Internet pages. Uh, we might run 30 or 40 spiders at any given point, reading maybe 19 or 20,000 pages a minute. A minute? Yeah. Wow. How many times does a new word have to be used before it, uh, it it's flagged? Uh, it depends on the context with which it's uh, associated. So if we have a high emotional context like uh, the nuclear, uh -huh. then we get uh, that flagged the very first time it's used. That's One time. Come across it. Wow. Okay. Hold on. Back in just a minute with Cliff, and we're talking about halfpasthuman.com. One of the most fascinating.